Hello everyone, my name is Jean-Claude Bergerman and I'm a professor of uh, open science policy at the Free University of Brussels. And before that, I was in charge of open access and open science policies at uh, the European uh, Commission. I welcome you all to this uh, new edition of the Frontiers uh, Policy Lab. As part of the, of, the, of the series of the policy labs, I'm speaking today to Sir Peter Glückmann, who has been at the national level a leading um, person in the New Zealand uh, science world because he has been the chief scientist between 2009 and 2018. And, and from that, he gathered a lot of experience in how precisely bridging the worlds of science and, and politics, an experience which is then translated in uh, the creation of the International Network of uh, Government Science Advice, the INSA. From your background, your experience and your, year, your years working as a, as a chief science advisor, what is one of the main lessons you would draw from, from what you have se seen unfolding for the last three to four months? Well, I think we're in a really unusual situation, Jean-Claude, where science and the business of science advice is on the front pages of every newspaper every day and has been for the last uh, four or five months. And within that, we've seen a right, we're learning a lot of lessons and there's a lot of diversity in what we're learning. And I think it takes a while to dissect and reflect and understand. If you look at the early stages of the pandemic, the issues were around when would a government take decisions to reduce transmission and what decisions would they take? And so the questions became, how prepared were they? And there's a lot to say about preparation. Then the questions become, what sources of advice did they take? Was it just from the epidemiological community? How important was modeling? How important was behavioral sciences and so forth in advising government? The next question was, what processes were in play? Were there formal processes for science to inform government or were there not? And were those formal processes used and were they effective or did governments have to set up ad hoc processes or was much of the influence coming from individual scientists outside any formal process? And then there's that interesting issue of what happens in that interplay between the culture of knowledge and the culture of policy making, which as you know very well, are very different. And how did that play out? Because we can give all the science advice in the world but if the receptor is not there in the form of the policy community and the political community, then it doesn't play out well. And then of course, there's the actions that followed. And I'm involved in a study that's looking at 120 countries at the moment and how they've responded. And I think we're seeing variations in each of those components. But I think right at the top of the list is were the policy community, the political community, ready to hear the advice or not? Were they willing to receive it, even if it created political uh, complications for them? And we can dissect out all those steps. If I dissect them out in bits, I would say most countries were not prepared. And even the WHO, in the end turned out not to be prepared, at least in one aspect. Probably the most important part of the early stage of pandemic management was locking borders. So there wasn't too much movement between countries. Now it was easy for a country like New Zealand or Taiwan, which are islands, not so easy obviously in Europe, but the WHO itself did not have border closure in its pandemic plan. So the pandemic plans that countries had, if they had them, were based on a different model. And the pandemic plans were largely left on the shelf. They had not been really, really turned into the preparations in terms of PPE and so forth that were needed and not reflecting 
what actually occurred, which is a collapse in supply lines on critical materials like uh, testing material for PCR and so forth. So there's a whole set of questions there about preparation, and we can come back to those if you want. Then there were a set of questions around the diversity of inputs. And I think we're getting to see that those countries that had diverse inputs probably did better. Social science was very important in the decision making. Thirdly, there was this interplay between was there a pre existing mechanism? Was that mechanism appropriate? In many cases, ad hoc mechanisms had to be created with advisory committees and so forth. But there was also a sense, which I'm still exploring, or we're still exploring, that a lot of the problems were over scientists competing for access to power and scientists of different disciplines competing for access to power or using the media as a way of transmitting their advice. And that leads into a whole set of issues around how science is transmitted in rapidly moving situations. For example, there's been a lot of reliance recently on non-peer reviewed preprints in, 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 or in very rushed and less than optimal peer review influencing decisions that are made. Yeah. And then I think there's a lot about the skills of those people at the interface, whether that's on the scientific side or on the policy side, were the people skilled enough to navigate the culture of rapidly emerging and incomplete science, yeah. transmitting uncertainty at the same time, were the policy makers, politicians, willing to hear the advice early enough? And so all those things come together and we can all pick out anecdotes of this country or that country to say what worked well. I think if we summarize what seems to have worked well, it is obviously in general where countries made early decisions to make hard constraint. So the countries that made very early decisions for, to go into lockdown or other forms of social constraint have done better in general. Conversely, the countries that are going out of it prematurely look as if they're gonna have real problems. But there were two other things that mattered. I think countries that were islands, like New Zealand, had it easy. They could, could put borders up rather easily. But countries that had experienced SARS, like Taiwan, Singapore, Hong Kong, Toronto, also managed, well, it's not a country, a city, uh, also managed from the, to use that fast experience for rapid response. And those countries were all primed to recognize that science was key to making decisions in pandemic management. The and third class of science of countries that probably did well are countries that respected science and didn't try and politicize the science. And, and that, that's a disparate group of countries. And, it's a, and, and that relates to pre-existing political and social culture in those countries, how science was perceived. But at the end of the day, I think it's about the individual competence of the scientists and policy makers, and whether they knew how to work with each other or not, and whether the policy makers were prepared to rely on science to make early and difficult decisions. For me, I mean, I've been following this now from another perspective than you for the last couple of months. and. and well, there are two things which 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 intrigue me. The first one, and it, it closely linked to what you said. The first one is there were early si signals, and of course, it is always easy to say it ad hoc. Right? That that we know. So there were early signals. They were quite strong, and it 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 took a while for the reason some of the reasons which you said to to be picked up. So for the future, we must think of a of a system to to translate these early systems much quicker. To, to the level where they should come. So that is one thing I would say, but then my second, my, what my second thought was, but why were these early signals so difficult to sell? And there I think, and I have a completely non-scientific uh, answer to this, uh, I think, and it is quite similar to the economic crisis uh, in 2007, 2008, where 
You know, in those days I was in, in, the, in the team of Barroso and we saw it coming and we simply couldn't believe it. We saw the figures, we saw the disaster coming and we thought this, this can't be true. And I think we have a bit the same reaction here that well, a I lot of our colleagues said it is, it, no, no, we are homo deus, you know, we are immortals, so it cannot be that bad. What do you think about that? Well, I think there are two separate arguments and they, they may sound contradictory. One is a set of arguments around uh, the previous experience. SARS was contained very rapidly, and yes, there were some tragic deaths, but it was contained very rapidly, and so that was not seen to be... Uh, and, and then the bird flu and swine flu epidemics turned out to not be as catastrophic as scientists had prepared. And exactly. so I think there was a lot of belief within the, the policy community and health systems, oh, we can handle any epidemic. We handled SARS, we handled MERS, we handled uh, bird flu, swine flu. And even Ebola, as tragic as it was in West Africa, that tragedy was a tragedy of, low, uh, of the context, context. In fact, once the science community got in there, it was actually contained and handled relatively rapidly, albeit with many thousand tragic deaths. And so I think on one hand, the policy community said, no, nah, we can handle anything. The scientists are overclaiming the impact. I think the other side of it is also scientists have perhaps a thought to have been crying wolf too often, you know, catastrophic about this, catastrophe about that. And so governments, it's all part of the same story. It, we couldn't get, it was hard for governments to believe this was as real as it is. And that's where the modeling arguments came in. The modelers, and I, you know, I'm skeptical of modeling in general as, as a predictive tool. It's all said and done a model of a model of reality. It's not actually reality. But put that aside, the narrative that they created of understanding rapid transmission was probably very helpful for some countries that could be persuaded rapidly to move. Um, I think in most cases, when you look at the countries that moved early, it was either because they had had past experience or because it was a very vocal, effective group of people who had access to power, who said to the government, for God's sake, listen to us, this one's different, move quickly. I mean, all said and done, we had the Wuhan experience to show what happened once it got out of control. On the one hand, you, you, there are a lot, of, a lot of structural issues which you raised, which you learned that we can do better. How can we make that more embedded in our, in, our, in our system? Because we cannot afford a second pandemic of this nature. We cannot make the world stand still another time for six months to fight it, to contain it, and so on. What can we learn for next time? I think, first of all, the problem is contextual. So every country is in a different context. How you would handle it in a country like Fiji is very different to how you would handle it in a country like Germany. So I think we've got to be very careful that we ensure that each country has a structure that is appropriate for its constitution, for its culture, that is there and pre-practiced and learnt from. And I think we're already seeing that, that in, there were countries that actually had practiced, but they didn't insert those learnings into preparing for the next time. So there are things to learn in that regard. We mustn't let this be seen as a singular event that we deal with and we move back to business as usual. It can't, this is actually a reset in many ways. Now, a lot of what I'm doing in New Zealand is around the broader reset in the economy, in the social sector, and so forth. But this actually is a reset for what science does, and it should be a reset for how science and policy work together, and how policy uses science, and how science falls into policy. If we don't take this opportunity now, and it will be difficult because everybody has their own views and everybody's trying to put their own stake in the ground, but if we don't take this opportunity now, 
we'll be back in this position in 10 years' time with the next coronavirus that emerges. No, that's right, Peter. And I, I really think we will not go back because too many people are on the right side. I mean, it is quite amazing to see how, how the, the, the consciousness raising of that we should uh, work uh, together globally, that we need to collaborate with open data, that we need to be proactive. Suddenly that, that has propelled to the front stage of, of, of a lot of academics, universities and so on. So I think, but, but the, the, what I'm still missing is, is who is going to be the clever leader to, to, to pull it forward, you know, because it will not happen sui generis. Well, you see, that's, that reflects Jean-Claude on my last comment. There's, everyone said that they, that they want their stake in the ground. They want the symbolic capital of doing it. I think, frankly, the ISC is in the best position to do it. Uh, it is the International Science Council. It is the leader of the major group on science at the UN. I think that should be its role. But there are others who will claim other things. But I would go further than that. I think... I hope you're right, and I, I would like to be optimistic that it will not return to business as usual. Science is critical to the future of the planet and critical to the future of the people on the planet. Having pre-prepared science advisory mechanisms with properly trained people on either side of it that is science, people who are competent in, in, from the science community to talk to politicians and policy makers and a policy apparatus that respects that evidence is critical in a crisis. Great, great conclusion, Peter. Is there anything you would like to add? I want to congratulate Frontiers for this format because I think it's this kind of format that allows these ideas that don't live well in a scientific journal, they don't get read well in mainstream media. This is a format that allows people to make judgments and to think through the issues for themselves and see that things are not all well and that we can do a lot better than we are doing now.